Welcome to Illustrated Beards, uh, brought to you by The Fantasy Shop, bringing you the best in comics and games since 1981. I am Jason. I am joined by my now and future co-host, Mike Bruder. How you doing? Mike. Good to see you. The, Good. Thank uh, you for the coming. The camera's freaking me out. It's a little bit space age. Looks like a starship. I'm kind of <laughs> I'm kind of freaking out. Like, I don't want to look at it because I'm afraid it's going to blast me. So, this is uh, this is going to be our official start of season three. We're going to do things a little differently now. We're going to we're gonna just talk about a single story. So, for this first episode, we are going to be talking about Civil War. This was a Marvel comic crossover event from five, six years ago now. I actually, I'm going to start with positive because I actually kind of like this book. Not only for what it is, but for what it did for the... Uh, future of the Marvel Universe, some of the Avengers initiative and some of that kind of stuff was really good. Now for the bad, I I don't I don't I don't know where to I don't know where to start. Okay, here we go. Sure. Po positive. Yeah. McNiven's art. It's great. I mean, Mark Millar handed him a steaming turd, <laughs> and and McNiven did everything that he could to polish said turd. Spectacular art for this book. Really did. But to me, at its core, it is poorly written. But worse than that, it is symptomatic of everything that I find wrong with the big two, but particularly Marvel. We're going to do this big event, but it's not going to make any sense, and you have to read all these other peripheral books. And by the way, a year from now, when it's all finished, no one's going to remember, nobody's going to care, it's not going to matter. Where's the Avengers initiative now? The initiative is over because it was all part of something that was building toward Secret Wars. Okay. And the fallout from that, where is it on the shelf? The fall from that is over. The, the, it was the wrong thing to do. They put a stop to it. They're not doing that anymore. It, because it ultimately doesn't matter. One stupid okay. reason for heroes to fight heroes completely nonsensically. It's terrible. While sure. I do agree with you that crossovers are hard to read because of all the other things, the peripheral stuff right. that's going on around it, for a story in and of itself, it does have a good beginning, middle, and end. I'm going to disagree with you. And here's why. Here's the beginning. We have the reality TV Little Warriors. kid heroes going yep. out, yep. and it causes an explosion, and a bunch of children die. So now we've tugged at your heartstrings. So there has to be this law passed, right? The problem is, is that the law doesn't get passed before the fighting starts. I mean, for example, look right at Captain America. He's talking to Hill. Hill says, well, Cap, this is going to be the law. And nothing, no legislation has been written, let alone passed. And she decides, well, OK, Cap, you're not going to pay. You're not going to abide, so we have to attack you. So, so, but first of all, when does anything ever get done very fast in the government? I mean, well, the law is being passed. Right. They are discussing so, it. So you have an absolutely fantastic opportunity to have all these intellectuals in the Marvel Universe sit down and say, this is why it's a good idea. That's argument number one. Argument sure. number two is that in the real world, being a vigilante is against the law. Well, you can't. Course. I can't just go out and beat the crap out of you know out of burglars and purse snatchers. I can't get away with that because I am not a legitimate enforcer of the law. But more importantly, why don't they sit down and talk and work through the argument as opposed to it being a ridiculous excuse for heroes to fight heroes because they don't have any more interesting stories to tell with the villains. The whole point that I'm trying to make is the very idea of something like this happening to the, the heroes in this universe right. is something that is going to divide them. Even if we weren't showing Captain America and Iron Man at the center right. of it, which I think are two good really have really good points. I mean, because while Iron Man makes a lot of good points, he makes a lot of the same points you just made about right. police, firefighters, these people have to do this right. too, we should have to do this. In this world, it is not illegal to put on a costume and go out right. and be a hero. It is, but they don't They don't let that become an issue when the heroes right. are saving the world. Right, it's a blue law, it doesn't really matter. Right, so the point being, what Cap's, Cap's point of view, the idea that uh, doing this is taking away his freedom as a citizen of the country, is valid because they're not government employees. They are people who are very noble, self-sacrificing people who go out and risk their lives on a day-to-day -day basis sure. to keep everybody else safe. And I understand that if that concept were applied to the real world, the backlash would be very similar to what this is. Right, the concept is not disinteresting. The execution, I think, is very, very poor because they use it as an excuse to have fight after fight after fight that are nonsensical and frankly uninteresting. I would read a book where people have a conversation and they argue and legislation goes to Congress, it goes to the Supreme Court. You can have good people with strong opinions that sit down and have a conversation as opposed to you jumping up and punching me in the mouth instead of listening to what I have to say. It's ridiculous. That's the overall premise of the book. Let's talk about this as a bad story. Okay. Nothing makes sense. 
all of it is like a series of little vignettes. It's like I'm, it's like I'm reading a seven issue montage. This happens, then this happens then this happens, then this happens. None of it is drawn together or sensical whatsoever. Let's say, for example, Sue Richards goes to Namor and says, Namor, we need your help. It's terrible out there, and you're Cap's friend, and I'm on Cap's side. Now, there's no explanation as to why I'm on Cap's side. Mark Millar has just arbitrarily said, this character supports this idea, and that character supports that idea. And Namor <laughs> says, why would I help Cap? Cap has turned his back on me. He's turned his back on Atlantis. Done. And then, at the end of the book, the Atlanteans show up to save the day. Now, there's no explanation as to why Namor had a change of heart. There's no explanation as to what Sue did to persuade him. There's no, hey, Namor's watching CNN and decides, hey, you know what, this is really going bad for Cap. I better go in and save his butt. None of that. It just occurs. And the entire book is a series of nonsensical, non-explained occurrences. I will agree with you. The appearance of the Atlanteans at the end of the story doesn't really make any sense. But it is there is a setup within the conversation that Sue and Namor have that implies their conversation is not over. And I understand what you're saying about, well, I want to see that conversation and I want to know what entailed what that conversation entailed. Right. But the mere fact that they appear at the end of the story implies that whatever that whatever happened right. in that moment, it worked. <laughs> That's such a good start. I'm sorry I yelled at you. Oh, God. Imagine right now, we cut. We come back and you and I are hugging and we're crying. We don't tell the audience. We don't tell the audience what happened. We don't tell the audience why it occurred. But at the end, we're weeping and we both agree that Civil War is the best book that we've ever read and everyone should be reading it. And then the show's over. That's it. It makes absolutely no sense. But let's talk about Spider-Man. The core of his character for 50, 60 years has been I have to keep my identity secret because the safety of those around me is important, right? It's more important. That is a core principle of that character. But Mark Millar in his infinite wisdom just arbitrarily decides that not only is he going to sign on to Iron Man's perspective, but then he's gonna to go to the entire world and say, I believe in this registration so much so that I'm gonna reveal my secret identity to the world. But it is implied heavily in that moment, and, and even in the subsequent moments where he has second thoughts and decides to join Cap, that Iron Man sold him a bag of lies, that everything that they were telling him was lies. He had no idea about the prison in the negative zone. Right. He had no idea about what was being done to the heroes that weren't right. complying and you know, with and this you idea. And you know why he didn't? Because his friends didn't tell him the truth, number one. Right. Number two. Also, he's not a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent. People, but they didn't sit down and have a conversation. They didn't just say, <laughs> okay, look, Tony, I'm with you. This registration idea, it could be really cool, but let's talk about the ramifications. You guys are building a prison in the negative zone? Why? I mean, why does it have to be this big fascist totalitarian thing because when it could just be a good conversation that S.H.I.E.L.D. knows who I am. The world doesn't know who I am, but S.H.I.E.L.D. knows that Spider-Man's Peter Parker and right, I'm enough? receiving some training. Isn't that enough? And that to me is interesting, but that's not what they do in the book. Well, but the characters, I mean, I don't think that Mark Millar was writing from any kind of well, no, he was trying to make unknown a movie. origin. Because the idea of characters like Fan Mr. Fantastic and Tony, in and of themselves, were members of the Illuminati. They mm -hmm. they think that their opinions and then their ideas about the world are better than anybody else. They're two right. of the most arrogant douches right. in the Marvel universe, and they think that their opinion is what is most valid, regardless of how they have to get to that end. So not telling Spider-Man is actually quite characteristic of who these people are. It's very much implied that what they're doing with the prison, what's going on behind the scenes, is only known to Maria Hill, right. Stark, and Mr. Fantastic, okay. because even Sue doesn't I, know. I'm not one of the smartest people in the Marvel Universe, but I know that that concept that, well, I know better than you, and we're just gonna do this, and that's that, is a foolish, foolish way for them to operate. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. It well, just but I, doesn't. But, but I very much think, I mean, you keep saying about killing the kids, tugging at your heartstrings. I don't think that was tugging at our heartstrings as the reader. I think that was supposed to be implied that that was tugging at their heartstrings as heroes and making them realize that this is a good idea, that this point of view needs to be at least looked at and talked about 
because we're because the things that can happen while we do this can be devastating to innocent civilians. Right. I don't think that those kids mattered to the writer. I don't. I don't think. Well, that, that's I think that another I, issue entirely. I, I think it, that that and that's what bothers me about the book. The most tragic and offensive thing about this book is that when Cloak <laughs> teleports them out of the negative zone, yeah. he can't teleport them back to the Baxter building, and so he has to get them outside into New York City so that Mark Millar can evoke all of his 9-11 emotion that he wants to evoke. And even though there's not a soul there, I mean, go through those panels. There are no bystanders. There's nobody running away from the destruction. There's nobody running away from the fight. But because page count had almost concluded out of nowhere, a cop, firefighters, paramedics, everybody and their brother that were the saviors of 9-11 tackle Captain America and Captain America looks out and he has his 9-11 moment where he realizes, oh my God, we're as bad as the terrorists. Please arrest me. Not Captain America, but Steve Rogers. And then, then <laughs> who, who picks up Captain America's cowl? The friggin' Punisher, a sociopath. A psychopath murderer, and he's going to become the new Captain America, which is a whole nother issue that we could spend an entire episode on, that <laughs> Captain America, Steve Rogers is Captain America, and the idea that Falcon's Captain America, or Bucky's Captain America, or Punisher's Captain America is all crap. The point is, is that it's just arbitrarily done because he had to make his point. It's really, think, really poorly executed. While that's valid, I think the point it makes for the story is valid as well. I mean, the point that Captain America knows that he has to fight for this, that he knows that this is an idea that he has to fight for. Right. And when he realizes what the ramifications of this are, he realizes not that he was wrong, but that he was executing how to deal with it in the wrong way. W w why, why did Cap oppose registration? Cap opposes registration because he is a citizen of this country and he deserves freedom just like everybody else. Okay, where in this book does he say that? It's an idea, I mean, that, that's, that's that. the thing, that's the thing. He is this, well, you want me to register, I'm not gonna register, and she's like, you are gonna register, Cap, it's gonna be the law, and he says, well, I disagree with you, and then she says, well, fine, Cap, we're gonna fight. It's, that's what happens. I mean, I understand what you're saying, but again, the idea that, that I think most people that I've talked to, and, and I, uh, we do, I mean, we as people do this every day. We talk right. about these kinds of things almost sure. every day. That's the idea they get from Cap's side, is that this takes away freedom, and it doesn't matter that he's been a government employee. It doesn't matter that he's been an it, agent of you shield. You know what's interesting though? What matters is that my freedom is at risk. Sure, and you know what? If Cap had actually said that, it would have been really interesting. <laughs> if Tony and Cap had sat down and they would have had a, an argument, if they would have presented their case to the Supreme Court or to you know the court of public opinion via the media, that would have been really, really interesting. But instead, Clone Thor has to shoot Goliath <laughs> with his fake Mjolnir. It, it's so dumb, it's so Foolish. It could have been so interesting. And all of these implications and read between the lines, which I disagree, I don't think they're in there. But even if they are there, it would have been much more interesting if they had actually broached those subjects head on and actually talked about it, as opposed to having really crapping, uninteresting fights. And I understand what you're saying, but again, myself and people I've talked to, there are a lot of subtle read between the lines moments and there were a lot of books that tied into it that gave you better context. Meaning, the I mean, I understand the problem with trying to sell me a bunch of books that I don't right. really want to buy just to keep up. But the idea of a crossover storytelling right. event in and of itself was, while we were reading the Captain America right. stuff that was tying into this, we were getting a lot of his inner monologuing. And mm -hmm. you just can't have that in this crossover book because there's too many main characters. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tune in to, I'm going to watch, I know it's over, but I'm going to watch Sons of Anarchy. And then something weird's gonna happen and it's not gonna make sense. And then it's gonna be brought to my attention that I have, I have to watch three 30 minute episodes of How I Met Your Mother, Sons of Anarchy <laughs> crossover for the Sons of Anarchy event for that episode to make sense to me. It's garbage. Tell a story, make it concise, tell it in one place, make it interesting. I do think it's necessary to read the other books in order to get the complete take on what this story is. But, I mean, 
and that, and I, I know I'm alone in this idea, but when a crossover like this came around, I mean, I bought every single issue that had right. a Civil War logo on it. And some of them were meaningless. Some of them were absolutely things I didn't need to read at all. And some of them were very important for the, the moments of, uh, the problems that you have, the, the stop gaps between these right. moments that you feel like you need more information about. So while I agree that this is not complete in and of itself, they made it complete with everything else. And the big giant omnibus hardcover edition included a lot of that stuff in there. Mm -hmm. So there is a way to read it as a complete story. This might not be the most effective way to read right, it. Right, which would be, story. I mean, without, without getting, you know, animated and vitriolic, that's one of my big problems with the comic industry in general, sure. is that this is not a good standalone story. Right. If you go to it, knowing who these people are, you know, from you know, from the film or from reading other books, etc. But you can't just jump in and read Civil War and have it make sense for two reasons. One, it's very, very poorly written. And two, you actually have to go and read a bunch of other stuff for it to make sense. There could be a book where the conversation between uh, Sue Richards and Namor continues, and it's really, really good, but I, I didn't get that. Right. And I think that's crap. I think there was, actually. I think one of the Fantastic Four times yeah, I'm, I'm sure, extended that I'm, conversation. I'm sure there was, but if yeah. I don't read Fantastic Four, I don't get that. The thing I get lost in in this book is the problem I have with action movies or action stories in general. Having action for the sake of having action detracts from your storytelling. But it's a huge event. Mark Millar, I mean, whether he wanted to or not, I'm sure the execs at Marvel were saying, you're gonna have all these superheroes, we gotta get some big fight scenes. Right. For you watching this at home, I'm, I'm a fierce capitalist. I, <laughs> I like money, I want my business to be successful, I wanna pay my employees more money. However, this is a perfect example of business getting in the way of art. The people who control the editorial room, those people are controlled by the shareholders. And the shareholders need to make money. And instead of making this one interesting mini series that you could or could not read and maybe see the ramifications sprinkled throughout other books, what we're going to do is we're going to give you part of a story here and then you have to tune into all of these other shows on all of these other channels to make sure you get the entirety of the story. And that's my primary issue with this book and with the big two in general. I feel like I have been cheated as a reader. Right, and, I, and I, I guess for me, it's because I can't look at it from that perspective. When I'm reading these moments, the other things are coming to my head that I read throughout this, so I can't look at it just as the right. seven issue Civil War miniseries. Where did, like, where did the Thor clone come from? Where did Spider-Man's weird costume come from? Yeah, you know, that was going on in the Spider-Man yeah, book at the time. All, yeah, all that stuff. You it just if you, if you come to Civil War, sure. it doesn't make any sense. So I will say that I think the best way to read this. I think we've clearly illustrated that the best way to read this is to read everything that that happens, so you can get all of these in between moments. Uh, there is a big hardcover omnibus available that put uh, the Avengers things that were tying into it, the Fantastic Four things, I had them all in the order that they should be read within these these seven issues. So here's what I'll say. My boss is, I'm, you know, he's good people. <laughs> so he probably wouldn't be upset with me saying this. Go to the library. If they have this in your library, check it out, read it, and you will get one of two experiences. Either A, you'll say, wow, that was really interesting, and I think that Jason's probably right. I want to maybe look into getting that omnibus. Or you'll say, ah, oh, you know what, Mike is right. That was absolutely awful. <laughs> and this is the quintessential example of poor storytelling. So, uh, I mean, love it or hate it, Civil War from Marvel. Um, I will say that I think 100% you should read all the other stuff that's going on with this in order to get the most out of it, right. clearly. Um, but like I said, love it, hate it. Uh, it's a Marvel event that is actually about to be the basis for a, the next Marvel movie. Right, and interestingly enough, I think that the movie has potential to be absolutely fantastic. The movie will probably and, be better. And I've got even <laughs> and I've got even money that says that the movie will make sense and that a lot of these ideas will be explored. I think the movie will be fantastic and I think it's gr it's it's great fertile ground for them to seed. Sure, yeah. I am definitely interested in seeing because they've said this is going to be their movie version of it, mm -hmm. not this. So, Civil War from Marvel, uh, check it out. That's going to bring us to the end of this episode. Thanks for sitting in and, and listening to us talk about all the nerdy things that we love. I'll be less angry next time, I swear. <laughs> Thanks, Mike, for <laughs> sitting down Thanks and for joining having, me. Man. I appreciate it. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to be part of the gig. Yeah. We will see you guys next time.